everyone. Welcome to the fifth and last day of this year's Process Mining Camp. Um, it's great to have you all here again and uh, we have a very nice program uh, for this this last day of this year's camp uh, where we are happy to welcome uh, Will van der Alst as our final speaker. Hello, Will. Hello, Arno. <laughs> now for the people participating in process mining camps in the past, um, you know that it's almost a custom that Will is uh, giving the closing keynote at camp. Um, of course, he's the chair of process and data science at RWTH Aachen uh, University and the founding father of, of process mining. And understand, Will, that today you are going to talk about um, yeah, machines and humans and how they work together in processes. So I'm very curious about that. Um, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks a lot, Anna. Yeah, as usual, it's an incredible pleasure to be here and to, uh, to, 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 to contribute to the camp. Of course, it's very, it's a pity that it is uh, virtual and that we are not uh, all sitting in Eindhoven. Uh, uh, I have the feeling everybody is getting a bit exhausted by all these virtual events. At the same time, it also offers many people uh, that live far away uh, to be able to, to join this. So the topic of my talk today uh, if Anna, if you can sort of, yeah, great, uh, would be to uh, to talk about uh, uh, linking process mining to things like uh, hybrid intelligence, automation, uh, classical BPM, BPM new style, and the basic question uh, that is in the background is that uh, how can we use data? to decide what we should automate and what not. That, that, that's a basic idea. Uh, so if we look at, uh, at uh, uh, how, how we can use data, then of course topics like artificial intelligence and machine learning are uh, very important. And one can use these types of technologies to automate individual tasks. Uh, so we can look at the task that is very repetitive and we can try to remove it. If you look at uh, uh, process mining, typically, it is not just a focus on the single task, but you are trying to, to improve and automate uh, the process end to end. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the other dimension that I will touch upon is the topic of hybrid uh, intelligence. And that is basically how algorithms together with people can uh, provide the best uh, performance. I assume that everybody has a bit of an idea of what machine learning is, if you would have to give a definition. It is uh, something that you want to behave in an intelligent way without being programmed. In other words, it learns based on, on data. Uh, we distinguish between supervised and unsupervised uh, tasks. Uh, su supervised means that you clearly know what you're looking for unsupervised, maybe that you want to find certain patterns or certain relationships. Uh, as in the context of, of, of process mining, for example, a typical unsupervised task would be something like clustering, uh, that you can see that there are similar uh, uh, cases. So the idea of, uh, of uh, uh, machine learning in the supervised sense is that you have a lot of inputs, you know what the output should be, so you train uh, uh, an algorithm in such a way that it starts to produce the desired output without being programmed. Um, in the last 15 years, uh, neural networks, uh, often also referred to as deep learning, have become the dominant paradigm. It's a, it's a paradigm that first was very unsuccessful but in recent years, uh, it started to work much, much better because of innovations in, uh, in, in hardware, but also innovations in terms of the software. So first it did not work, but now it works incredibly well. And it works specifically well on very uh, specific tasks, yeah, where it's very clear what the task is that needs to be done and it produces the desired output. I think everybody uh, knows examples from, uh, let's say, image recognition automatically. If you see an, an image, for example, my background, that you automatically identify whether that creature is a dog or a cat. Uh, just by training a neural network based on many examples, it is able to do that very well. The same if you look at machine translation, for example, translating 
uh, English to German uh, using neural networks, uh, uh, these techniques work very well. So there are incredible successes for very specific tasks. However, if we look at operational processes, then we basically see that these, uh, that these deep learning based techniques hardly play a role. Uh, we, we read about this in the newspaper, but in real organizations, it, it, it does not play a major uh, role. Uh, one of the issues is, of course, that uh, uh, in order to, to improve the compliance and performance of processes, you cannot focus on a single task. It may be uh, that even for simple processes, you need to consider dozens of different activities done by many different people. So it's not so clear, especially if you are interested in, in, in the end-to-end -end, uh, behavior of, of a process. Uh, also, the models that one generates, they need to be understandable. If you look at neural networks, uh, then they, have the, they may have an incredible good predictive power. Uh, so they are able for selected tasks that they will be able, able to do things flawlessly. Uh, but you cannot look at the model. Uh, that's why there is the field of explainable AI, which tries to, to address exactly that uh, problem. So if we are improving processes, we would like to see process models that we can understand and interpret. Um, another issue is that many of the tasks where these uh, machine learning techniques work very well, they require labeled data. Uh, so for example, one is able to, to recognize that the, the creature behind me is a dog because uh, there were many people labeling pictures and saying this is a dog and this is a dog, this is a cat and this is a cat. So there is labeled data and if you would go to the data in a normal organization, uh, the data is not labeled yet. You need to first process the data in order uh, uh, to get uh, such a clear, well-defined uh, problem. So, uh, machine learning in the narrow sense, uh, based on deep, deep learning, is incredibly uh, uh, hyped. Uh, so you read a lot about uh, this. So there are these funny quotes, like for example, the quote here that says process mining is 20% of analytics that drive 80% of the ROI. And uh, Marco, one of the PhDs in our group, is saying that neural networks are 20% of the analytics that drive 100% of the hype, uh, which are kind of indicating a bit of criticism on, on uh, these exaggerated expectations on what the actual impact of uh, machine learning techniques will be on how we run processes. So, uh, as Niels Bohr said, it's very difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, and that's and like, like I, we are now in brainstorming mode, thinking of how work will look in 10 or 20 years. And there I, I start with some, let's say, historic, uh, uh, let's say, cases where people try to predict something and they were completely wrong. So there is this very uh, interesting to read uh, rant report from uh, 64. And in this report, which was written in 64 by a large panel of experts, there were these predictions that you see here. And so they predicted that uh, in 84, and so many years ago, there would already have been a permanent lunar base. Uh, we would have uh, manned flybys uh, uh, towards uh, Mars and Venus. Uh, many of these predictions that were there, uh, they did not happen. Some of them are even funny. Uh, so for 2020, they predicted that at this point in time, we would be using, we would have apes around us, I don't know, to drive cars and to do, uh, let's say, a simple work and we, should send, we would send apes to, to combat. So, so this is just to, to show if you make predictions how wrong you can, can be. At this point in time, if you look at the field of, uh, uh, of AI and machine learning, from the outside there is this shiny uh, thing uh, that, that, that does all of these tasks perfectly 
And uh, it looks that it is very, um, very clean and very sophisticated. But for the people that know better, that look behind these seams, they see that there is a lot of engineering to make this work for very particular uh, tasks. And so there is no such thing as general intelligence that will sol solve all of these uh, problems. So if you look at our home, uh, then uh, in our home, we have lots of intelligence devices today. Uh, so uh, AI and machine learning are not things of the future. These are things that are already in our homes. Uh, so our home is loaded with intelligent devices that we control with our voice, etc., etc. This is nothing exceptionally. This has become the new uh, normal in a way. At the same time, despite this prominence of some of these uh, products, there are also expectations uh, that seem very reasonable that are completely flawed. Uh, so here you see a prediction by Elon Musk uh, made in 2015, where he was saying that the car that would have full aut autonomy uh, would be there, uh, that in principle, uh, in the lab, this was already working. If we look at today, uh, a few years later, uh, that did not happen yet. Uh, so I'm convinced that this is going to, to happen, uh, but is, it is not there uh, yet. Uh, another pre prediction by uh, Jeffrey Hinton, uh, one of the Turing Award winners of a few years ago. Uh, he would predict uh, that we, we should stop training uh, certain people for certain jobs uh, because machines would do much better. Uh, that is still not the case. So there are these things that we predict uh, to happen very soon, and they, they, they do not happen. And that is because uh, we underestimate, let's say, the, the, the qualities of humans to do certain tasks. So if I summarize, then, then you could basically look at machine intelligence and human intelligence. And if you look at machine intelligence and you say what it is very good at, it is very fast, it is efficient, it is cheap, it is scalable, uh, and if it's trained well, it will uh, respond in a consistent way. Yeah, so there are many advantages, and for many jobs, uh, uh, this works very well. If you look at human intelligence, on the other hand, then we see that, uh, uh, that there are other strengths. Yeah, so human intelligence is flexible, creative, uh, we can feel what other people are feeling, uh, something that it would be very difficult for a robot. We uh, respond uh, in an instinctive way. And even if we are confronted with completely new situations that are completely different from any situation that we have seen before, we are still taking experiences from the past and that will help us to, uh, to make the proper decisions where a neural network that would have just been trained using some type of data would respond in a completely different way. So the idea of hybrid intelligence is to combine the strengths of human intelligence and the strengths of machine intelligence. And this is, let's say, a new area uh, uh, at, that looks at the balance between these two things. And of course, when I say that, it is not that much new, but we are constantly shifting the boundaries of what is done by machine, what is done by humans. And the thing that I would like to stress is that in many situations, it's best to, to simply combine both. The, the graphic that you see here is the human is in the lead and is calling the machine intelligence as a kind of tool. And so this is the classical way that we uh, uh, think of, of IT. So the humans want to do certain things and software and algorithms, etc., are just tools to, to help the human in achieving that task. Another view that you could take is that the machine is in the lead. And so the machine is taking care of, for example, a process and the machine is calling the human uh, the moment that he encounters a situation that requires, for example, lots of flexibility. So uh, if, if we look at, at hybrid intelligence, the idea is to, 
to uh, combine the best of both worlds and to, to constantly look at how we are distributing work over humans and machines. And of course, this is in, in a way an old question. That's why I, I started by showing, let's say, these predictions in this uh, RAND report of, of the 60s. Uh, but at the same time, what we see is that uh, robotic process automation, machine learning, AI, and also process mining are basically reviving this old question and, and is impacting where the division is exactly. Um, if we look at, at, at let's say, uh, changes in the short term, we always think that things are go very slow. But if we look further away, or we look further back, then we realize that things are changing at an incredible speed. Right? That, that, that's an effect that I think many people uh, uh, know. Uh, in this report that I'm showing here, uh, there are the predictions of what are now the jobs that are going to disappear and will be taken over by robots. And robots could be in hardware or this could also be software robots. And then you see that, uh, for example, in logistics, in finance, it is expected that uh, lots of jobs will, will disappear. So there are several of such uh, reports and they basically make predictions of how this border between what is done by machine intelligence and what is done by human intelligence, how that border is shifting. Uh, if you look at, for example, call centers, then you see that uh, this is a development that is going very, very quickly. What we see is that there are fewer and fewer people working in call centers and more and more is done by, by software robots. And so this is already a reality and it is uh, kind of making many jobs uh, disappear. Uh, this is another report of the World Economic uh, Forum and it's also indicating what are the jobs that are disappearing and what are the jobs that are, uh, let's say, coming into existence. What is more important? And uh, uh, this is a very interesting question uh, to think about uh, how these things will change. What I told so far was very broad. Now I'm going to, to go back more closer to home to automation and, and process management. And so how, how does hybrid intelligence and all these things that I talked about, how can we, we relate to that in, in the field of, of process management? Um, to talk about that, uh, let's go a bit back to the origins of workflow management and business process management. And there, it is also to show that we are often wrong when we are predicting how things are uh, being changed. The first workflow management systems were uh, created in the 70s. And so here you see a picture of, of Skip Ellis, who at the time was working in, in Xerox uh, together with Gary Nutt. And they uh, developed uh, a workflow management system that they called an office automation system at the time uh, based on PetriNet. So you would model a process and the system would then automatically support that process. What is also very interesting, and, and I spoke to, to Michael Zisman just two weeks ago, it was a very interesting uh, discussion. So he uh, developed the first workflow management system ever in the mid 70s. Uh, this was also a workflow management system based on PetriNets. And I had a fasc fascinating talk with him uh, where he was talking about, let's say, his expectations on, on what would happen. For the people that do not know Michael Zisman, uh, I think he's a very interesting uh, a person. Uh, he was, for example, also for some time the CEO of Lotus. Um, uh, and, and I think many of the people remember also the group where uh, products from, from Lotus. Uh, in recent years, he created a, a, a software company to create uh, golf tournaments, uh, which was for something completely different. Um, what this is showing is that in the 70s and also in the 80s and the 90s, there was a great optimism on uh, how workflow technology would change whatever uh, we, we do. The question is, did it work? Uh, so what you see here is a picture that I uh, created 
uh, let's say a long time ago. And in the mid 90s, when I was also writing books in, in, in the field of workflow management, I was a strong believer and I was thinking that workflow technology would become as normal as database management systems. And that any organization would have its processes supported by workflow management technology. Uh, did that happen? Uh, the simple answer is no. So I was involved in the beginning in many workflow management projects. Many of them failed. Uh, so in a study together with IORIers, we even found out that many organizations would buy workflow management technology, but it would never be put into operation. And why did it not work? It was uh, very expensive. It was very difficult to, uh, to create process models that would behave as real processes. Uh, people would model, but uh, models were always a very crude approximation of, of reality. And in the end, people did not believe these process models anymore. And they were simply too disconnected from reality. So this led to, uh, to let's say, a lot of the disappointment. Uh, to emphasize the point that, uh, uh, that process models cannot always capture exactly what is going on, let's take a look at uh, uh, what happened at the beginning of the corona crisis. At the beginning of the corona crisis, uh, all the uh, German people ran to the supermarket to, uh, to try and buy toilet paper. So in two days, all the supermarkets were empty. There was no toilet paper left anymore. In the Netherlands, what people did is they, they ran immediately to the coffee shop to get hashis. In France, they ran, uh, I don't know, to buy wine. Uh, so this is just to illustrate that if there is an like a disturbance, a major change, uh, for example, caused by something like COVID or some economic crisis, uh, the models that we have no longer work. Yeah, so so it, this is very di disruptive and there is no way that, that according to the model you can deal with this. So what was the problem of, uh, of let's say, classical business process management? Uh, and I would like to identify three main, main, main issues. Issue one is that if we are modeling, we think that we are capturing human behavior, but we are not. And the simple example is that if we look at the, the basic processes that any organization has, like purchase to pay or uh, order to cash, uh, so the simple uh, processes that any organization has either to buy products or to sell products. Uh, in many of the org organizations, specifically if they are larger, it is not uncommon to find thousands of different variants of executing such a simple process. So it's very naive that you think, okay, let's create a BPMN model. Let's from this BPMN model now generate a workflow management system and we can deal with this complexity. That is very naive. So we underestimated human behavior. Another thing that we underestimated, we underestimated the data that plays a key role in these uh, processes. So if you look at uh, like at the full SAP HANA installation, there are 800,000 different tables. Uh, if we make BPMN models or we configure a workflow management system, we are always trying to abstract from this complexity. So information systems are very complicated, also on the data side, with many different tables that have one too many and many too many relationships to them. So that was a mistake. And the last mistake was that uh, often we were very happy uh, with the technology uh, without actually focusing on, okay, uh, what, does now what does now lead to actual process improvements. Uh, there was very, uh, very little emphasis on reflecting and measurement, measuring what the impact of, of certain things are. So this led a few years ago to the feeling that the BPM space is dead. Uh, so here you see uh, let's say one of the keynotes at, at the BPM conference a few years ago, 
by the co-founder of Bonita Soft. And he was saying BPM is not dead. And if people are saying that, then that is typically a, an indication that there is a, a problem. Also, the classical Gartner BPM summits do not exist anymore, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, the BPM area uh, was really in trouble. So at this point in time, BPM is going through a revival. Uh, so there is again a bigger interest in that. One of the key drivers of that is, uh, let's say, the uptake of process mining. Because of process mining, many people that did not believe in, in, in looking at process models anymore uh, now, again, consider this to be relevant. Uh, another uh, important uh, development which rescued BPM uh, was uh, the uptake of robotic process automation. Uh, so, Classical workflow management technology did not work, was too expensive. Robotic uh, process automation is a technology that in many cases uh, can work, where classical workflow management uh, technology would not be applicable. So if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the changes behind, let's say, the uptake of process mining and the uptake of RPA, is that there is a shift from formalisms to data. And so before there was lots of emphasis on, on, on modeling and being very precise. There is a shift uh, looking more at, at data and to also look at insights that you can generate from data that can trigger actions. What we also see is that there is a shift from trying to replace the existing system using workflow management or BPM technology to running these automation technologies on top of existing systems. It is super naive if an organization has invested a lot of money in, for example, running the processes on top of SAP. It is very naive to propose a technology which will replace that all. Uh, I believe that we should much more think, okay, all of these systems are there. If we want to improve processes, we should uh, not replace these systems, but have a layer on top of these systems to, to, to manage these processes in a better way. So uh, for this audience, I probably do not need to explain what process mining is, but I, I'm still saying a few words about it to be able to relate it to, to the things that I just uh, mentioned. So. Uh, in any process, in most of the processes, there is the 80-20 rule. And in most cases, it is even more skewed. And uh, just to explain what I mean by that, but I think many of you are familiar with the Pareto principle. If we would create a process model for all the cases, it may look something like that, like a spaghetti-like model. If we just focus on the 80% most frequent uh, cases, uh, then we typically get models that are very uh, simple. Yeah, so this is a phenomenon that I think everybody that has used Disco and has played with the slider has seen. If you move the slider all the way up, uh, the model looks very complicated. If you then move it down, then often already at 80%, the model uh, looks much simpler. So this is very nice that with, by leaving out just 20%, we get the simple model. However, there is an issue uh, related to that. Because uh, on the one hand, 80% uh, of all the cases are described by only 20% of all the, all the variants. Also, these 80% of the cases are typically the cases that are not problematic. However, if we look at the remaining 20%, yeah, so the infrequent variants that we easily leave out when we move the slider, what we see is that these remaining 20% is explaining 80% of all the variants. That's not so much a problem. But what we also see is that this remaining 20% is also causing 80% of all the friction. So rework, price changes, complaints, uh, let's say, uh, endless loops, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, process mining is a great technology to, to kind of distinguish between what is frequent and what has no problems 
and what is infrequent and is causing uh, friction. So examples of frictions are highlighted here, but I think everybody that has applied uh, process mining in reality is doing process mining to, to identify some of the problems that are listed here. So process mining can help to identify uh, such things. So uh, if we look at the adoption of, of process mining and at all of these camps, it's kind of nice to reflect. And so so we, are, we are almost, let's say, 10 years uh, uh, doing these types of events. And what you see is that uh, process mining moved from something being very academic uh, to something uh, where there are easy to use uh, commercial tools. And of course, uh, DISCO was one of the first tools to make uh, process mining available uh, in an easy way to a, to a much larger audience. Uh, what we see in recent years is that uh, so despite the availability of good tools, process mining was still invisible for a very long time. I think what we see, uh, let's say, in the recent years is that it has become much more, much more uh, visible uh, how, how widespread uh, the use is and how much value it delivers. Uh, so, as a pointer, I, I've been involved in a Deloitte study that came out a few years, uh, a, a few weeks ago, uh, that very nicely shows that of the people that are applying process mining, over 80% uh, see tangible improvements, and over 80% of the people, uh, let's say in this survey, would also like to expand the use of, of process mining. And I think that's very important that organizations do not use process mining as just a, like a pilot project, but they try to scale up uh, supporting by multiple processes. Probably later in Slack, I, I will uh, put some pointers to, to the things that, that I'm talking about. So this is a, a high level view of process mining and this picture may be new uh, for, for most of you, um, uh, but in, in the way it's just describing what we have been doing over the last couple of years. So if you look at this picture, then you see it starts with the extraction of event data, then we discover process models, then we uh, look at these process models to see where are the bottlenecks where are the deviations? Where are the problems that we would like to analyze? And if, if you have enough data and your process is stable enough, you can start applying machine learning techniques uh, to also make predictions and to automatically suggest improvements. So what you see is that as process mining is becoming more mature, we are moving more to the right-hand side of this diagram, uh, where the focus is on actually changing processes on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you look at the machine learning component of this, eh, because this, high, this relates to what I was talking about in, in the beginning. So if you look at the machine learning component in uh, this life cycle model of, of process mining, then the machine learning techniques can be used to answer questions like, how long will this case still take? And so we have a case, the case is in the middle of the process. Can we predict when it will be done? Can we predict whether it will deviate? Can we predict whether the outcome will be positive or negative? Uh, if we are in the middle of the process, what will be the next activity be? But also things at the more aggregate level. So. Uh, we don't have a bottleneck today, but will we have a bottleneck tomorrow based on the combination of historic information and current information? Uh, can I still accept new cases? Or if I accept new cases, will that create a bottleneck? These are all questions that you would normally not be able to answer, but by having done process uh, discovery and aligning uh, your event data with the process models, you can generate machine learning problems uh, that answer such types of questions. Um, what is very important is to not start at the end. And I think many organizations are wasting money because they start by, okay, 
uh, machine learning AI that all sounds very, very fancy. Uh, uh, let's do that. You can only do that if you uh, have done these first phases. So you need to identify and understand the processes in order to generate uh, uh, the relevant machine learning problems. So another connection that I would like to make is the connection to RPA, so robotic process automation. Uh, as I said, this was one of the other lifelines of, uh, of BBPM. So the basic idea of robotic process automation, uh, eh, which was triggered by industry, uh, is that we don't try to replace the system that is there by something new. What we try to replace are the people that are sitting in front of, uh, of, the, uh, of the different information systems. Uh, unlike process mining, uh, this is a bottom-up technology. Uh, so you look at certain tasks done by people that are very repetitive, and that allows you to, to gain uh, quick, quick wins. Uh, so obviously RPA and process mining complement each other very well. Uh, so process mining is typically done more top-down, improve the end-to-end -end process. Uh, RPA is when we identify that there are certain parts that are super repetitive, uh, that we can uh, uh, automate them without replacing the system. So uh, to visualize that, uh, what you see on this slide on the, on the left-hand side, you see the classical situation where people are sitting in front of uh, computers interacting with many different applications. And the idea of RPA is that you don't replace the system at the bottom, but you replace, let's say, people sitting in front of these machines when they are doing repetitive work. So you first need to identify what the repetitive work is in order to be able to automate this. And of course, process mining is perfectly suitable for this. Some people then start using different names, like for example, task mining. But the basic idea is that if you look at traditional automation, you look at high volume work that can be done completely automatic, where it is a no-brainer that it should be automated, and it has been done so long time ago. On the, on the other end of the spectrum, you see the very rare and exceptional behaviors uh, that, that will always require human involvement. And RPA is the sweet spot in the middle. Uh, where there are things that would normally not be cost effective enough to automate, but now you can selectively replace repetitive human work by such software robots. Uh, of course, the challenge is to, to extract event data in order to be able uh, to, do, to do process mining on RPA. So what you need to do is that you need to uh, 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 to extract the events from all the user interactions that users have with all of these different systems. And of course, a very easy thing to spot is that people are doing, uh, let's say, copy-paste actions. Uh, these are clear indications of where a software robot could, could do some uh, things. The problem is, of course, that if you let this do, be done by a robot, that robot will also make uh, lots of mistakes because it doesn't know the context. Uh, if there is if something completely new happening or you have customers that have very specific requirements, you cannot see that. So a nice uh, example of something that is in the middle is a, is a startup from, uh, from RWTH. And I'm supporting uh, here three former students a bit uh, to, to get this started, is... Uh, uh, basically automatically filling out forms based on process mining and machine learning techniques, but in such a way that the human is always in control. And, so, and that means that tasks that would normally take, either, let's say, two minutes can be now done in 10 seconds. But still, the human in the end is in control and can, uh, 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 let's say, use his knowledge uh, flexibility, et cetera, et cetera, to, to do this in the proper way. This is just a concrete example 
of where you see that this boundary is shifting. If you look at the uh, interplay between process mining and R RPA, then as I mentioned, we first would like to view what people are doing. So rather than collecting data from the back end, we are uh, collecting data from the user interactions that people have. Uh, uh, if we are able to do that, we can identify the repetitive work and we can replace certain activities by a robot, uh, as, as you can see here on the right. Uh, yeah, so so you, you're replacing things that are continuously doing copy-paste actions by, uh, by software robots. Uh, but what is, of course, more interesting is that this situation will be very fluid. Yeah, so uh, with the example that I just gave from this, this spin-off of RWTH University, is that uh, how work is divided between people and machines uh, will be made much, much more fluid. Yeah, where uh, robots assist people and people assist robots in a completely symmetric uh, way. And what is very important is that in the background, uh, process mining is continuously running, overseeing what is happening, and is also uh, able to spot uh, major problems. To come to a conclusion, because we're also running out of time, I, I hope that I uh, gave you an idea of uh, what hybrid intelligence uh, is. Yeah, so it's the combination of human intelligence and machine intelligence. Uh, both have their own strengths. And what we will see is that there will be a continuously shifting boundary of what is done by people and what is done by humans. I deliberately showed all these false predictions in the beginning uh, to show that where this boundary lies is not so clear. And, and, and often uh, certain things that seem simple are very difficult and uh, there are also situations where the, it's the other way around. The second thing that I showed is that I showed that BPM was, let's say, close to being dead. And by these changes in viewpoints, so becoming more data driven, becoming uh, more focused on, on data as evidence rather than looking at models, and also automatically taking actions and automating uh, in a very uh, smart way, I think that is uh, something uh, that, that gives uh, BPM an incredible new uh, boost. And one can see that uh, with, with all the attention that is there at this point in time. So by combining BPM with process mining and RPA, we're able to address the problems that I mentioned out, uh, before. So what we are doing is much more closely following what the complexity of reality with very variable behavior of machines, very complicated systems, and uh, a continuous focus on the actual improvements that one is uh, achieving. If you are interested in uh, this uh, and you would like to read more about uh, this, I'm showing here two, uh, let's say, pointers to, to, let's say, recent papers that are talking about hybrid intelligence and the relationship between uh, process mining and RPA. And I feel that we are just at the beginning uh, of this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Will. It was a really interesting uh, keynote. So that's a lot, a lot of stuff to think about regarding machines and humans and our processes, um, how they interact to, with each other in processes. Um, we have quite a few questions in the community. We don't have time to get to all of them, but let me pick one up and I have a quick question um, before we go um, into the Prosmining Cafe. And I understand you will be around also later in yeah. the Prosmining Slack a little bit for um, some offline um, discussions from the questions. So one question from Ruhl is um, RPA is potentially, uh, no, with regard to RPA, haven't we actually set up the pro uh, the process properly and should we not first try to fix it or automate it before we look at RPA? I think that is partly true and partly not. And so uh, one could argue that in many cases RPA could be seen as a temporary solution, right? something that you would like to support in a solid way, uh, but you, are, you have to fight with existing in information systems that, 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 that you have. 
uh, so you consider it to be something inter intermediate. Uh, I think that, that that's the reasoning behind the, the question. Of course, one should try to optimize end-to-end -end processes, but uh, uh, it will become a big disaster if you uh, try to, to say how end-to-end -end processes should be improved without really understanding the complexity and also the data behind it. As you know, there are many organizations that went bankrupt just trying to replace one ERP system by another ERP system. So if that is already so difficult, please uh, don't think that this is very easy. And I think RPA, unlike workflow management technology, provides a way to, to let's say, cut some corners here and there to get some quick wins. Uh, but I agree that in many situations, if you would design the system from scratch, you would probably not use RPA. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to be pragmatic here is what I hear you say. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Very last quick, te more technical question, perhaps. So you're talking about the um, kind of the low level data, right? That um, is being analyzed in the context of RPA and that there um, you've shown there's the aggregation and the correlation that needs to happen to look at those processes. Do you think that the correlation or the aggregation is more difficult? Uh, I, I think that they cannot be seen separately. And I think that uh, uh, the, that's a topic that I think I talked about at the last process mining camp or, or, or two, two camps ago. I think one of the difficulties that we have in, in the process mining space is that uh, whenever we do analysis, we are focusing on a single case ID. And we want to, to analyze where does the case start and where does the case uh, end. And what you also see in these RPA scenarios, uh, like the single case ID is often not so, so clear. And if you, you think about the correlation problem and also aggregation, where are the boundaries, uh, you get exactly into, into that topic. And so I think you, you cannot separate it, but clearly this is something that, uh, uh, that is very difficult. Uh, if you look at real life RPA scenarios, eh, so some RPA vendors will will suggest to you, okay, you do some, some machine learning and then automatically you generate a robot. I think that is a scenario which does not exist today. Using process mining, I think you will have a much more realistic situation where you're trying to find out what is the repetitive work And then you need to look at that as a human, again, the human intelligence to decide what you can automate and what not. I don't believe in fully automatic solutions. I think that's very unrealistic. Okay. <clears throat> yes, great. Thank you very much. Thanks again for um, this interesting talk.